Good morning. Welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Social Media Manager for HAR. I'm joined this morning by Patrick Jankowski. Patrick, welcome. Very good. Thank you for having me again. Thank you so much for being here again. We're excited to hear from you and hear an update from when you were here a few months ago. Um, for those of our members that are just getting getting to know you for the first time, if you could just introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, my name is Patrick Jankowski. I'm the Senior Vice President of Research at the Greater Houston Partnership. Uh, I've actually been with the organization for 36 years. I've uh, been here working and studying the economy in Houston since the early 80s. And uh, one of the things I do is I put out a newsletter, we provide research support to the organization, and just try to help the community understand what's going on in the region. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so obviously, we have a lot to talk about uh, with, with the economy and the recession that we keep hearing about. So we're, we're going to hear your, your take on all that. Um, so if you are tuning in this morning, uh, make sure to like this post and share it so that your audience can see it as well, because Patrick has some really great insight that he's going to be sharing with us today. Um, I want to just quickly talk about uh, the real estate market a little bit. Uh, as you know, we put out mo monthly market updates having to do with single family and, and, and uh you know, different property types uh, for residential, but I'd like to hear if you have any updates on commercial real estate. Okay, let, let's start with probably the, the weakest sector out there and we'll build up to the stronger sectors. Uh, the weaker sector out there right now is the office sector. Mm -hmm. uh, we overbuilt office space during the, the fracking boom and we still haven't recovered from that. Uh, number of different reports out there, different research firms, whether it's CBRE or Colliers or NAI or JLL, but we have between 50 and 60 million square feet of office space that's currently available. That's about a fourth of everything in the market. Uh -huh. uh, so we're seeing very softness in the rental rates and you're not seeing very much construction right now. Only about 1.7 million square feet is under construction. If you go back to 2014, we had as much as 17 million under construction. The office market is going to be the one that's going to take the longest to recover. That's the weakest market. The next one, it's kind of a, a little bit of a tie between industrial and multifamily. Mm -hmm. Industrial is strong right now, but it's in danger of over, overbuilding as well. Right now, there's about 20 million square feet of industrial space under construction. Uh, 20 million square feet under construction. In a good year, we might absorb six, seven, eight million square feet. So we have three times the amount of space under construction as we can absorb in a year. We're already starting to see the availability rate creep up. Uh, this time last year, it was 8%. Now it's like 10.6%. So mm -hmm. that's like saying one in every 10 square feet. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that'll slow down a little bit. Uh, the next market, which is a little bit better off, but there's a little concern there, is, is multifamily. Uh, we did real well pulling back on multifamily for a year or two, but we're starting to, I'm worried we're starting to overbuild. Right now there's 21,000 single family units, uh, I'm sorry, 21,000 multifamily units, apartment units that are under construction. Uh, that's probably about twice of what we need, uh, but these things go through cycles. Uh, the healthiest market out there right now is the retail market. Uh, we only have about 3.6, 3.7 million square feet under construction. Uh, just about everything which goes on gets built, gets absorbed. Of what's currently under construction, about two, thir two thirds of it's already pre-leased. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're in retail, you're doing fine. Multifamily, a little concerned. Industrial, you're okay, but this time next year, probably not. Office is going to take it's going to take a few more years for the office market to recover. Are there any areas around <laughs> Houston that are more concerning than others? Uh, well, if if you want to look at it, it's kind of ironic. The the one that's probably I'm more most familiar with is multifamily right now. Mm -hmm. Is the sectors that have the highest occupancy rate are actually in uh, A Leaf and Sharpstown, mm -hmm. and those are not considered prime markets, but that's where there's a lot of Class B and Class C space. Mm -hmm. And that's what we consider to be workforce type housing, and that's doing real well. Uh, some of the weaker areas are actually uh, like Conroe and Pearland, mm -hmm. and some of the places inside the loop. Downtown is still struggling. We, we pretty much overbuilt downtown. Mm -hmm. But uh, like I said, it's all cyclical. It'll, it'll come back around. We just need to, if we, if we, this time next year, we're still on pace to build 21,000 multifamily units, we'll definitely overbuilt. Mm -hmm. Multifamily, I mean, uh, industrial. We're probably close to being overbuilt, but not there yet. Okay, so biggest areas of concern, if you will, for commercial real estate 
Sounds like multifamily. Multifamily and industrial. And industrial. And office, we're just going to have to wait it out because the office market is overbuilt and it will be for several years. Okay. Um, so if you are just tuning in for Member Focus Monday, uh, we're joined by Patrick Jankowski. He's the Senior VP of Research for the Greater Houston Partnership. Um, he has a lot of great information to share with us this morning about the Houston economy. Um, so make sure you share this with your audience so they can hear it as well. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, jobs market, specifically the Houston jobs market. Can you update us? On, on what's going on there? Okay, so far this year, we've created just shy of 30,000 jobs, which is pretty decent. We're on the pace to finish up this year with 60 to 70,000 jobs. And that's about normal for a long-term long -term average for Houston. Uh, we're seeing some areas where we see real strength, some areas where, where there's some concern. We are starting to see a little bit of a slowdown in construction. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because of the, there's no office construction going on. And, and that's because all the chemical plants that were being built a couple of years ago, we're not building quite as many of them. Uh, oil and gas is probably going to be a little bit more weaker towards the end of the year. And that's because we're seeing a drop off in the rig count. We're not seeing as many wells being drilled as, as we saw this time last year. Uh, the rig count, we've actually lost over 200 rigs since the first of the year, which is about 20% of the rigs that were operating out there. Okay. That's going to come back and have an effect mainly on manufacturing because uh, a significant amount of manufacturing in this town is geared up to serving the oil and gas industry. Uh, areas that are doing real well, uh, finance, insurance, real estate is, is doing real well, healthcare is doing very well. If you look at uh, the, 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 the accommodations and food services, you know, restaurants, bars, hotels, they're doing well. Uh, if you look at just kind of general professional services, they're doing okay. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing some losses in some area, weakness in other areas, but all setting it all, we're probably on pace to have about 60 or 70,000 jobs this year. That's good. And as far as percentage, what is what does that equal out to, or what do we? Oh, uh, what that we're is? we're looking at probably a percentage wise, I'd say about two, two and a half percent growth. That's good. That's good. Um, so a big question that we had for you: we keep hearing a lot of chatter about a, a potential recession. Um, we wanted to hear, we, we talked about this a few months ago when you were on this program, um, and, but we just keep hearing it even more now. So if, if you will, kind of explain to us why we keep hearing this and, and what your thoughts are on, okay, on it. Okay, that's, that's one of those stories that will not die, and it <laughs> should die. Uh, last year, everyone was talking about a recession, and the reason behind it was they said, this expansion's gone on too long. Mm -hmm. We just can't continue to expand forever. And the expansion continued, and the expansion continued, and the expansion continued, and people says, well, I've got to find another reason for a recession. This is not working. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of funny. Uh, a while back, when Janet Yellen was still ahead of the Fed, mm -hmm. uh, a, a reporter asked her, uh, Ms. Yellen, don't you think this expansion's gone on too long? Aren't we overdue for a recession? And she said, expansions don't die of old age. And so <laughs> we shouldn't be concerned that the expansion's gone on so long. There's usually an event which causes a recession to take place. Uh, it can't be old age, and now everyone's pointing to the global slowdown, and that's the reason why. Uh, and yes, we are seeing a slowdown in global growth, but it's not slowing down to the same extent that people think. There's a difference between a slowdown and a collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking at growth this year of about globally of about 3.2 percent. Mm -hmm. That's down from previous years where we had 3.6 or 3.8. But what's not getting reported out there is if you go to the IMF, you go to the OECD, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, you go to the World Bank, they're actually showing a slight uptick in growth this year. So the downturn is in 2019, but an uptick next year. Mm -hmm. And yes, the slowdown in global growth has some concerns. It's probably a bigger concern for Europe because more of Europe's economy is geared towards exports. But uh, just you'd be surprised. How much do you think the U.S. economy is tied to exports? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's only <laughs> about only about 12%. Okay. And so you consider only 12% of our economy is tied to exports, and then what fraction of that is tied to China? Mm -hmm. So yes, we'll have some slowing down, but it's not going to send us into recession. There has to be an event which pushes you into recession. Okay. If you look at previous recessions, you can go back to uh, 2000. Uh, let's go back to 19. We've had like a dot-com bust, if you remember when the dot-com right. bust. That was something which brought on a recession. If you look at the uh, housing bubble busting, mm -hmm. that brought on a recession. You've seen recessions brought on by high oil prices or a spike in oil prices or high interest rates. Or right now, it's really unlikely we're going to see a spike in oil prices. Mm -hmm. And it's really unlikely with where we are with the Fed that the Fed's going to raise interest rates. If anything, they're going to keep on lowering them. I don't see what the trigger is out there. There has to be a trigger. Mm -hmm. Now, the trigger could be 
the global trade war. Mm -hmm. But, you know, like I said, OECD, IMF, World Bank, they're all showing a slight uptick in growth next year. Uh, my concern is, is that we're going to talk ourselves into this, mm -hmm. that we're going to be talking so much about it that these conversations that people are having are going to affect their behavior. I was at a lunch in the spring for BOMA, Building Off Owners and Managers Association, and was sitting at the table with, with the gentleman, and he said, yes, he and his wife were thinking about buying a new car, but they're worried about the economy, so they decided to postpone the decision. Mm -hmm. Well, you have enough people deciding, well, they're going to sit and wait to see what happens. They're going to bring on the slowdown just mm -hmm. by their actions. Did you tell them to go buy the car? <laughs> <laughs> car and a house. You should buy a house, house and, and, and a, a house, car. Yes. Um, but right now, I don't see, you know, the, the one concern is if we have slower growth, uh, it's like an airplane. If you're not flying fast enough, you could hit a stall speed mm -hmm. or the turbulence may upset you. Uh, I don't see the fundamentals out there that signal a recession. I just see slower growth. Okay. So maybe we should back up for a second. Could you actually define what a recession is? Because it sounds like what we're hearing and the, the uh, verbiage that's out there isn't so much a recession as a slowdown, slowdown. as you're saying. Right. Uh, there's actually an organization out there called the, the National Bureau for Economic Research, and they actually have a group there called the, the Business Cycle Dating Committee. Mm -hmm. And they actually go and look at a number of factors, and they actually have a mandate from Congress to be the, the for, official organization which dates the business cycle. And nation, nationwide, they look at, there's a, a, a common belief that it's two consecutive quarters of declining GDP. Mm -hmm. but. The Business Cycle Dating Committee, when they're dating uh, the entering of recession, the ending of recession, they look at a number of factors. They'll look at GDP, they'll look at retail sales, they will look at income, they will look at employment, they'll look at wholesale sales. The definition they have, the decline in activity across broad sectors of the economy consistently over time. Okay. And so you might see a decline in retail sales, but still see GDP growing. You might see a slowdown in employment, but you might still see some GDP growth because of productivity gains somewhere else. So it's not simple, a decline in GDP. You have to see a decline in various sectors across the economy. Okay. So bottom line, a slowdown does not equal a recession, right? No, slowdown <laughs> just means slower growth. Slowdown means slower growth. Okay. Um, now let's, let's talk about Houston specifically, because if we are experiencing a slowdown uh, or expecting a slowdown, how do you see that affecting Houston? Uh, if we see a slowdown, uh, it'll affect the couple. The sectors will affect most. So obviously, one will be construction because mm -hmm. we're already overbuilding in construction. And if you see a slowdown in activity, people are going to be less willing to lease office space or take on industrial space, so there'll be less demand. Uh, you'll you'll see it in manufacturing because there'll be less of demand for manufactured goods. You might see a little bit of weakness in oil and gas because the demand demand for fuels will decline, and you'll see it in a few other areas. But a, a slowdown would simply mean slower growth for Houston. It wouldn't mean a recession. Mm -hmm. If you want to look at the long term for Houston, we, we average about 60,000 jobs a year over the long run. If there was a slowdown, if, once again, I'm saying if there was a slowdown, you might see that drop down to 30 or 40,000. Uh, in, in a boom time, we do 80 or 90,000. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not see a recession in the U.S. in 2020, and I do not see a recession in Houston in 2020. Okay. I will. See, I can see a slowdown, but I, I do not see a recession in all the data that I look at. Well, that's good news. That's yeah, yes, good to it's hear. very good news. Um, just because you've you've been studying this in Houston for over thirty six years now, as you said, um, in the past when we have had slowdowns or recessions, how has that worked out here in Houston? Do we do we experience it at the same level that the rest of the country does? Houston tends to lag the U.S. going into recession. There's a myth out there that, that we're also the first one out. Mm -hmm. And I need to let you know, we may lag the U.S. going in, but we also tend to lag the U.S. going out. The one exception to us leading the U.S. out of the recession was the Great Recession. And that was because we had a fracking boom going on. Mm -hmm. And while the rest of the U.S. is struggling, we said they found this thing called the Eagle Ford Shell. And there was a lot of investment that went in there. But if you go back and you look at downturns, like the downturns, you then need to check. Uh, the 1990s recession began nationally in July in 1990. Mm -hmm. Didn't hit Houston until 1991 in July. Mm -hmm. uh, by August, the U.S. began to recover its jobs, but Houston didn't start recouping jobs until 1992. Mm -hmm. And so we may be late to follow the U.S. in, but we're not the one to lead the U.S. out. That's, that's a myth that people want to believe, but it's not true. 
Right, okay. Um, so if you have any questions for uh, Patrick Jankowski, type them into the comments and we'll get to those questions in just a minute. A lot of people telling you great information, great conversation and, and wishing you a good morning. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so as far as the rest of the year, tomorrow is the beginning of quarter four for 2019. Um, what do you expect to see in this last quarter of 2019? And what, again, you've already given us some idea of what to expect next year, but what do we see for 2020? Uh, I, I would expect the last quarter for us to, in the Houston area, to add 30 to 40,000 jobs. Okay. We always see employment pick up in the fall. Uh, part of it is seasonality as, as people start hiring for the, the, the shopping season. Part of it is contracts which have to be fulfilled by December 31st and they bring people on to mm -hmm. uh, finish up the contracts. Part of it is teachers, people coming back from summer vacation starting to work. So we will see job growth mm -hmm. in, the, in the fourth quarter and, and probably 30 to 40,000 jobs. Uh, you'll see people rushing to get projects completed so you might see a little bit of a surge in construction activity but I really am concerned about construction slowing down. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and, but I expect to see retail sales will probably remain fairly strong because uh, consumers, it's interesting, if you look at, if you look at the data out there, well, look at your own data, look at the housing data. Mm -hmm. uh, on a 12-month basis, sold over 100,000 single-family homes mm -hmm. the last 12 months. That tells me Houstonians have a strong, strong feeling about this town, that their long-term outlook, they're, they're, they have a lot of confidence in the long-term outlook for it. So I don't see a slowdown even in the fourth quarter. Okay. In 2020, it's gonna depend upon uh, Part of it is going to depend upon just how much more we continue to talk about the inevitable of, of a recession. Uh, I'm surprised no one's asked me yet about the impeachment uh, mm -hmm. trials, or not the trial, the, the impeachment proceedings going on. And I, I kind of like to joke, says, well, if, if Congress is so focused on trying to hear the evidence, maybe they won't get involved in passing rules and regulations that interfere with the business community's ab ability to do its job. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so Deborah actually asked, uh, she did ask a question, what can we do to keep the Houston economy as stable as possible? Uh, what, can we, what can we do? Well, one thing the partnership's doing is we're actually trying to recruit new companies to the region. We're working very hard. We actually have a group in California, as I speak, meeting with different uh, CEOs and officers of the different different companies out there, trying to let them know about the advantages of doing business in the region. Uh, our philosophy is if we can get something here, get them to get a toehold, maybe they won't relocate an entire operation, but an office or a facility. And after they've been operating in Houston for a while, they'll see the benefits here. Mm -hmm. So one thing, you support our efforts to go out there. The other thing is, and this is kind of more philosophical, I think Houstonians are often sometimes our own worst enemy. And uh, you talk to people and, and they'll complain about the weather or the mosquitoes or, or, <laughs> or, or the rain or the flooding or whatever like or that. Or the traffic. Or the traffic, and we shouldn't be talking our town down. I mean, this right. is a great place. Uh, you think about, it, if you want to get some idea, since 1989, the population has just about doubled. We've added 3.4 million people. The city wouldn't be going, or this region wouldn't be growing if it didn't have something to offer. So sure. if, if, was it Deborah? Mm -hmm. yeah, Deborah, don't talk to city now. Tell your friends not. Next time you're in a, in, a, in a party and someone starts to complain about the traffic, <laughs> just let them know. People who are in traffic at 8 o'clock in the morning, they're on their way to work. Yeah, they're They have jobs. Job. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a good thing. If there was no traffic on the freeways, that would mean that, that people were sitting at home uh, surfing the internet looking for work. Yeah, that's true, that's very true. Uh, Thomas asked, uh, you mentioned in the impeachment proceedings, Thomas asked, uh, what about the election effect on housing? Uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't thought much about that. I, I think that the two things that are gonna have the biggest effect on housing, and one is whether we continue to see interest rates slip, which mm -hmm. would be a good thing for housing, and also the consumer confidence. Uh, if, if people feel that they're going to be able to still make their note regardless of what happens with the election with the economy, uh, we'll continue to house a large number. Mm -hmm. If people start to, if interest rates go up, which I doubt they will, or people start to worry that the outcome of the election is going to slow economic growth, that may have some infact, influence on whether people are willing to uh, sign a note. Yeah. Um, about the uh, interest rates that you mentioned, so you, you don't see those going up? Next year, no, for I don't. example? No, I okay. don't. Do you, you see them remaining low or going yes. lower? Or? I, I see them flat to lower. Okay. Okay. Um, 
Natalie, uh, it says Natalie and Ivan, actually, uh, which industry is showing the most economic growth in Houston? Which industry is the most economic growth? If you want to look at it by just absolute jobs, it's the, the, the restaurants. The restaurants mm -hmm. always grow. You know, there, there are different ways the economy grows. One is you have your base industries which grow. And those are base industries are, are what you think of things like the oil and gas industry or manufacturing or petrochemicals. The other is you have industries which grow based on, on population and income growth, and those are consumer-oriented. Right now, the consumer-oriented industries are really doing pretty well, and that would be restaurants and bars and so forth. Okay. Well, Houstonians, we like to eat, right? Yeah, would you like to eat? Would you like to drink in this town? That's something you should always promote. Yes, exactly. Um, Shandell just said, thanks for the reminder not to talk not to talk down our city, especially on social media. Um, Steph said, historically, people slow down in buying during election year um, because they fear the unknown. And that, that's a valid concern. Uh, you fear the unknown, so you're going to, to sit in your wallet and you're not going to write as many checks or, or, or make as many uh, transactions. Uh, and, and I can see that. The thing is, Regardless of what happens with the outcome, the U.S. economy is still the largest in the world. Uh, in spite of what people say about China being so large, if you go look at the IMF data, he's, uh, the U.S. economy is still 50 percent larger than China's is. Mm -hmm. uh, the long-term prospects for the U.S. are strong. They, they shouldn't worry about it. I mean, yeah, they may pull back, uh, but six months or a year after the election, they'll find out that in spite of whoever, whoever gets back in office, the U.S. will still grow. It's still going to be a great place to you know, to live, work, and, and to do business. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would not, uh, I'm, I'm not overly concerned. Okay, very good. Um, so a lot of the questions that I, I prepared for you today, I pulled directly from your economy at a glance. Can you um, tell us about the economy at a glance? How can people get it? Because obviously our our members are interested in this information. Where can they get this from you? Okay, economy at a glance, it's, a, it's actually, the, the name is actually Houston, the economy at a glance. Yes. It's a newsletter, five to six pages, comes out once a month, and it focuses on, on issues, whether it's demographics or pop, uh, demographics or economics, that have relevance in Houston, things which are affecting or driving the economy. Uh, you can get it by going to the Partnerships website. You can go to, it's the easiest, we have the easiest web address in the world to remember. <laughs> it's Houston.org, yeah. it doesn't get any easier. You go to Houston.org, you can go uh, under data or under business resources, or you can just in the search engine there, search for Glance, It'll call up the most current issue. And you can also, we always have the, the previous 12 issues online as well, so you can go and see what we wrote about uh, back in December of last year or March or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's always, either on page four or five, there's a box, and the box says, do you want to know more? And in there, there's a hyperlink you can click on, and it takes you to a spot where you can subscribe to Glance. You just need to look for the little box that's usually at the very end of the document, and in it, there's where the hyperlinks are where you can subscribe. And I encourage you to do it. It's totally unbiased. We mm -hmm. try real hard. And we have a philosophy at the partnership. We want good information out there. We want factual information out there. That way, if people have good information, they're more likely to make better business decisions. Absolutely. And so that's what we're trying to do with Glance is provide good information to help people make better business decisions. Very good. Thank you. I always look forward to it. I get excited when it hits my inbox. Um, Thomas asked a question about interest rates. Uh, Will interest rate follow world trends further down? Uh, there's some discussion about that. When you're seeing all the other central banks lowering their interest rates, is, is the U.S. going to have to follow suit to remain competitive? Mm -hmm. uh, that I really don't know. I, I really, to be honest, I really don't have a good answer for that. Okay. So. Okay. Um, so it looks like all the questions at this time from our members. Do you have anything that you wanted to add? Uh, no, just realize don't talk ourselves into a recession. Don't, don't keep on, uh, if we keep on saying it, we'll believe it and it'll influence our behavior. And we've been having this conversation for 18 months now and it still hasn't come to fruition. Right, so. right, and that makes sense. Like you're yes. saying, we, we just keep talking about it, but it's not happening, so maybe it's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right, very good well, point. At, at some point there will be a downturn. Sure. But looking at the data that I see now, I do not see where the trigger is for that downturn. There has to be a trigger. Mm -hmm. uh, if, I, if I can, just real quick. Absolutely. It, you know, in the 69, the 70 recession, mm -hmm. that was caused by interest rate heights and physical austerity. We were pulling back from the spending on the Vietnam War. The 73, 75 recession was a stock market crash and an oil price spike. Mm -hmm. The 80, 82 recession was interest rate hikes and an oil price spike. 
the 9091 recession was consumer pessimism in an oil price spike. You're hearing a theme there about oil price spike. I, yes. I really don't think we're going to see an oil price spike. Uh, the 0102 recession, the dot com bust, and weak business investment. The 0809 subprime mortgage crisis. You know, there has to be a trigger, and right now mm -hmm. I don't see what that trigger is. Okay, that makes sense. So I think kind of the big theme of this is slowdown does not equal recession. Yes. And we're waiting to see if we see a trigger. Yes. Right. Okay. Well, before everyone uh, tunes away, we do want to do our final drawing for HAR Engage, our real estate conference. Um, if you haven't been following this, uh, every week this month we uh, did a drawing for a $50 Supercenter gift card, and to be to be entered in the drawing, all you had to do is purchase your, your ticket for Engage. So Patrick's actually going to draw for us. Got to love that sound effect. <laughs> and if you want to read it for us too, that'd be good. Okay. Yeah, if you can. Let's see. Rebecca Haga, H-A-A-G-A. -A -A. Rebecca Haga. So Rebecca, you have a $50 Supercenter gift card coming your way. Uh, and for everyone else, if you have not registered for HR Engage today, September 30th is the last day to get your ticket at a discounted rate. It is $159. Tomorrow that pricing goes up to $209. So if you're if you're looking to save $50, bucks, which who isn't, right? Uh, get that ticket today. Uh, Patrick, thank you again for coming on. This sure, has been for wonderful. Me. And we were talking beforehand. I think you're just going to have to be a series regular here. Uh, anytime I can share some insights which help the real estate community, I'm glad to do it. Thank you so much. And it looks like all the questions we had from them, just more people thanking you and saying great mm, information. Thank you. All right. Well, that's it for this Member Focus Monday. We will be back next Monday at 9 a.m. with Congressman Dan Crenshaw. So be sure to tune in next Monday at 9 a.m. Have a great week. Bye-bye.